emergency medicine, it's a it's a world of high stakes and constant uncertainty, isn't it? We're always making these rapid fire decisions. Absolutely. And the evidence base is always shifting under our feet. Yeah. What you learned five, even three years ago might not be the standard of care today. That's exactly it. You have to stay current. It's a professional imperative. It is. When you're in the thick of it with a critical patient, you need to know your practice is aligned with the absolute latest, sharpest evidence. So that's our mission for this deep dive. We're going to cut through all the noise and look at five, just five, high impact developments from the last couple of years that are truly changing practice at the bedside. Right. Actionable stuff. We're hitting five key areas. Yeah. Point of care ultrasound or POCUS. Okay. A huge shift in trauma resuscitation. Then we'll cover a head injury management. Uh, both screening and intervention. Two for one there. Exactly. Then a game changer for severe pneumonia. And finally, we'll tackle that long-standing debate about fluids and sepsis. All right, that's a packed agenda. Let's jump right in at the bedside with diagnostics. So POCUS, point of care ultrasound. It feels like its domain just keeps expanding. It's not just for trauma anymore. Not at all. And in 2023, the American College of Emergency Physicians, ACEP, they, uh, they made an update that kind of made it official. Official in what way? What's the new piece? The big addition is bowel ultrasound. Specifically, they've added it as a core application for diagnosing small bowel obstruction, SBO. So it's now officially sitting alongside the big ones like EFAST, cardiac, lung scans. Exactly. Aorta, DVT, and now bowel. It's part of the standard toolkit that an EM physician is expected to have. And that's, I mean, that's more than just an academic note. That really changes how you can work up acute abdominal pain, right? Oh, completely. SBO can be so tricky to diagnose and x-rays are, you know, often not very helpful. Right. But with POCUS, you can see those dilated fluid-filled loops of bowel right there at the bedside. Yeah. Within minutes. It's about speed and triage. So it moves it from like a cool skill that some people have to something you're actually expected to know how to do. A credentialing issue. Precisely. The guidelines are clear on this. It requires competency. The expectation is that you are trained and credentialed in this. It's about empowering you at the bedside, but with that comes responsibility. Okay, so let's move from the abdomen up to the head. Traumatic brain injury, TBI. Specifically, deciding who needs a CT scan. Ah, uh, yes. The age-old question. There was a big refinement in the UK's NICE guidelines back in 2023 that's having a ripple effect. It really is. And it targets this very specific, very common scenario. The patient on an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet who has a minor head injury. The one that for years was an automatic trip to the scanner. It was a safety blanket. Yeah. The patient's on warfarin. It's their head. CT scan, no questions asked. A very defensive knee-jerk approach. So how does this new guidance change that trigger? Well, the NICE guideline, which is you know respected globally for being so evidence-based, it shifts the language. It now says clinicians should consider doing a CT head scan. Consider? That's a big change from do. It's a huge change. It's a move away from that automatic scan based only on their medication list. Now it's about a proper individualized risk assessment. So what does that look like in practice? Who's the low-risk patient we might actually be able to just observe? We're talking about someone who is completely, well, otherwise, GCS of 15, no amnesia, no vomiting, maybe they're under 65, okay. and perhaps they're only on, say, a single agent like aspirin. The guidance encourages shared decision-making period of observation instead of just radiating everyone. So it's about being smarter with our resources and avoiding those low yield scans. That's the core of it. A more thoughtful clinical approach, not just following a rigid rule. All right, let's shift gears into the trauma bay. This is where I think some of the biggest logistical changes are happening. For sure. And we have to talk about whole blood. Right. For so long, massive transfusion was all about component therapy, juggling bags of red cells, plasma, platelets, a real logistical nightmare and a crisis. But the standard is, uh, it's definitely moving. And the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, EAST, put a real stamp on this in 2024. They did. Their practice management guideline gave a conditional recommendation for using low titer type O whole blood LTOWB for any adult trauma patient needing a massive transfusion. The military has been doing this for years, but this really brings it into the civilian mainstream. Mm. What's the, I guess, the core physiologic advantage? Why is it better? It's just, it's blood the way it's supposed to be. It delivers a near perfect one to one to one ratio of red cells, plasma, and this is key, functional platelets, all in one bag. 
Instead of us trying to play catch up with separate products. Exactly. With components, you're always behind on fixing the coagulopathy. Whole blood gives more balanced resuscitation from the very first unit you hang. It's just more efficient. And from a workflow perspective, I can only imagine the relief. It is transformative. One product to manage instead of three. You don't have to wait for plasma to thaw. It simplifies everything, reduces errors, and saves minutes. And in hemorrhagic shock, minutes are everything. Okay, let's stick with trauma for a second, but go back to TBI. You said there was another key update from those NICE guidelines. Yes, a really important one about intervention. It's about the use of tranexamic acid, or TXA. Which we already use, but this is about timing, right? Yeah. Getting it in much, much earlier. Much earlier. The guidance is now for patients 16 or over with an isolated, moderate TPI. And how are they defining moderate? A GCS between 9 and 12. Yeah. So a pretty sick patient. If they don't have other major bleeding, you should give a 2-gram IV dose of TXA as soon as possible. As soon as possible, meaning even before the CT scan comes back. Yes, even before you have definitive imaging. The target is within two hours of the injury. Wow, a 2-gram bolus within two hours. That's a huge procedural shift for a lot of places. It is. It reframes TXA as a proactive, time-sensitive, neuroprotective drug, not something you think about later on. Is there a major catch here? A key caveat. The big one is that the injury has to be isolated. You need to be confident there isn't, you know, a ruptured spleen or an unstable pelvis. That's the real life threat. So assuming the head is the main problem. Assuming the head is the problem. This early dose is endorsed to try and stop an intracranial bleed from getting worse. It's aggressive, proactive care. Okay, let's transition out of trauma and into severe infections, sepsis. We have two massive trials here that are really redefining things. They really are. Let's start with severe community-acquired pneumonia, CAP. The use of steroids here has been debated for, for decades. Constantly debated. But the Cape Cod trial, published in the New England Journal in 2023, I think it's fair to say it has settled the argument for the sickest patients. So what do they do? What was the setup? Cape Cod was a big multi-center trial in France. They took patients with severe CAP and gave them either IV hydrocortisone 200 milligrams a day or a placebo. And the key here is the word severe. Who qualified? You had to be critically ill. So, meeting high flow oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, or already on vasopressors for shock. Okay, so the sickest of the sick. And there the results, go. they weren't subtle. Not at all. The mortality data was stunning. They found an absolute reduction in 28 day mortality of about 6%. 6%. In critical care, a 6% absolute risk reduction is enormous. It's a home run. And on top of that, the need for intubation dropped significantly from almost 28% in the placebo group down to under 20% with the steroids. So what's the thinking here? It's not just about adrenal support, is it? No, not at all. It's about tamping down the massive inflammatory storm that severe pneumonia causes. The steroids are calming that systemic overreaction that leads to organ failure. So for that critically ill pneumonia patient in your ED, this is now standard of care. It is. Early hydrocortisone, ideally within 24 hours of admission. It can change the entire course of their illness. All right, finally, let's tackle the biggest dogma in all of sepsis care. The fluids first mandate. The sacred cow. Exactly. The Clovers trial, also from NEJM in 2023, went right at this. Liberal fluids versus a more restrictive strategy with early pressors. This was the trial so many of us were waiting for. It gave us the permission structure we needed to de-risk using norepinephrine earlier. So they took septic shock patients and split them into two arms. That's right. One group got the traditional liberal fluid strategy. You just keep pushing fluids until they stabilize. The more is better approach. Right. And the other group got a much more restrictive strategy, a small initial bolus. And then if they were still in shock, you'd move right on to starting a presser like norepinephrine. And the big fear has always been that if you restrict fluids, you're going to underperfuse the patient and they'll do worse. So what did Clovers actually find at 90 days? This is the crucial finding. There was no significant difference in 90 day mortality. No difference. None. The restricted group had a mortality of 14 percent and the liberal group was 14.9 percent. They were, for all intents and purposes, identical. That is a seismic finding. So if the outcomes are the same, it makes you wonder why we've been pushing so much fluid for so long. Well, it allows for personalized care now. It shatters that rigid 30 millimil per kilo for all rule. We now have top tier evidence that a restrictive strategy can be just as effective. So you're no longer feeling forced to dump three liters of saline into an 80 year old with heart failure and kidney disease. Precisely. You're freed up to use your clinical judgment. If the patient looks dry, give them fluid. If they have a history of fluid overload, 
you can now confidently reach for that norepinephrine much earlier, knowing you aren't harming them. You're avoiding the very real dangers of fluid overload. Wow. That was an incredible tour of the evidence. When you put all five of these shifts together, you start to see a larger pattern emerging. You really do. It's a move away from that rigid, one-size-fits-all dogma. Right. Whether it's POCUS for SBO or whole blood instead of components. Or risk stratifying TBI instead of scanning everyone, while also being more aggressive with TXA in the right patient. And then tailoring resuscitation and sepsis and pneumonia with trials like Clover's and Cape Cod, the theme is precision. It's all about precision. We're getting much more surgical, much more thoughtful with our interventions and our diagnostics. And it just underscores how you have to stay on top of this stuff. Integrating this new evidence is, uh, it's just the core of what we do. It is. And, you know, we want to leave you with one final thought to mull over. We've talked about how fast things are changing. The rate at which these landmark trials are coming out is just exponential. It's overwhelming sometimes. It is. So the question for you to think about is this. What dedicated system or what personal habit do you rely on to make sure your own practice stays current the very moment a new piece of practice changing evidence like this is published? That's the challenge for every single one of us at the sharp end. Something to think about on your next shift We'll catch you on the next deep dive.